If you feel like darkness is, has come upon you, if you feel like depression is smothering you, if you're trying to get your head above water for what is facing you, begin to worship the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. And it changes the whole atmosphere. There's hope when you praise the Lord. There's deliverance when you praise the Lord. There's salvation when you praise the Lord. If you would like weekly content that builds your faith and helps you walk out all that God has for your life, subscribe and be a part of Life Family. Passion Week is, uh, is recorded in all four Gospels. Um, Matthew de dedicates two-fifths of his gospel to the final week of Jesus Christ. Mark dedicates three-fifths of his gospel to the final week of Jesus Christ. Luke, he gives Jesus' final week a third of his entire gospel. And then John, who we're going to be reading out of today, uh, it's over 50%. So we're going to be reading out of John 12, but John has 21 chapters. He gets to this week right now in John 12. So he spends a lot of time on how precious this week is to him, and it is also to us. On the Jewish calendar, we usually celebrate Easter right about in now, Passion Week, kind of late March, early April. But for the Jews, this uh, month would be on the 10th day of Nisan, not the car, the month, Nisan, uh, on this triumphant entry Sunday, every Jewish family would go out and select a lamb that would be sacrificed on Passover on Friday. And God selects his lamb that will be sacrificed in Jesus Christ our wonderful Passover lamb. How many are grateful for what Jesus Christ did for you? John 12 is a mashup of two messianic prophecies, and we're going to read it together. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here we go. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, all right, stop, because that, that wasn't a very good effort. It says shouting, shouting, Hosanna. All right, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found and sat on it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, Father, Son. see, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Very good. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the very first time the people of Israel called Jesus king. They had called him rabbi. They had called him another, another, uh, a number of names. Uh, but they never called him king. King points to you are Messiah. Here is Jesus coming into Jerusalem. There is a wave of popularity bringing him in and an opposing wave coming toward him of religion. Hosanna. They cry, Hosanna. Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? Well, uh, if, you know, I would say it, it means praise because, you know, they're waving palm branches. They're shouting Hosanna. Uh, it, it, it means praise, sure, but it means a little more than praise. It's kind of a, a, a truncated kind of uh, meaning. Hosanna means save now. Hosanna means save now. Save us now. Boy, that would be my prayer as well on this Palm Sunday. Lord, save us. Save me. Save my family. Save my community. Save my nation. Save my world. Lord, save now. Save now. Psalms 118. Here is the uh, messianic psalm that John includes in his passage. Save now. 
or Hosanna. I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Every generation prayed they would be the generation that they would see the fulfillment of prophecy and Messiah would come in during their lifetime. They all believe that Passover is when Messiah would be revealed. So they were highly expectant. Will this be the year Messiah is revealed? But every year, it was the same old thing. No king, no Messiah, and this year was worse than all others at that time. Rome was a cruel taskmaster and an occupier of the Holy Land. But they had hope in their heart because Jesus was here. And Jesus checked all the boxes. He was a mysterious man. His upbringing, where he came from, who his rabbi was, what was his proven model. Wasn't a lot known about Jesus, but people loved him because he checked all the messianic boxes. He, he did miracles. He fed people. He taught people the word of God. Uh, he gathered disciples. He was authentic. He was real, and he was compassionate and they treated him like a celebrity. He could go nowhere, nowhere. He couldn't go to a restaurant. He couldn't go to a home. I mean, people were clamoring after him because he gave them what religion could not. The Jewish leaders, the religious leaders hated Jesus. The Bible tells you why. Because they were jealous of him. Jealous of his popularity, jealous of his authenticity. He did not fit their mold. There were so many ideological differences between Jesus and the Jewish religious system. Here are a few. Religion emphasizes the outward. Jesus emphasizes the inward, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Everybody was so uh, wanting to keep rules, and those rules were how you looked, how you acted, what could they uh, perceive you doing. It, it's, it's, the, it's been the same, and Jesus is always in opposition to religion because he wants to know what's happening on the inside of you. Religion is often what you can't do. Jesus is about what you can do. Here's what I can do in you, and here's what I can do through you. Religion puts up barriers. Jesus pulls down barriers. If you were in Jesus' time and you wanted to go to church like you are today, well, if you were a Gentile, you could go, but you couldn't get close because there was a barrier that said, court of the Gentiles. And then if you were a woman, sorry, you can't come in the sanctuary. There was a court of women. And then if you were a Jewish man who was observant and so forth, you, you might could go in and get closer. Jesus, the first thing he does is he pulls down barriers and he says, all are welcome at the Father's table. I just want to thank the Lord today that he, he allows me to come in. Hallelujah. Religion says, earn your way. Meritorious actions that you learned that you have to do these things to be worthy of God's presence. Jesus says, I am the way. Don't worry about the meritorious activities that people are expecting of you. You can't do enough to be good enough for God. I am the way, says Jesus Christ. I am the truth and I am the life. Come to me and you have the Father's presence. Hosanna, Hosanna. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone. One of the greatest prayers you can ever pray on this Palm Sunday is save me, save now. Don't save me in uh, next week or a year. Save me now. Save now. Hosanna. Hosanna. Save me now from myself. 
The second definition that you can read into Hosanna is submit now. And you see this literally happen 600 years before Jesus was born, a prophet named Zechariah prophesied this, Zechariah 9 and 9. This is the second prophecy included in John's reading today, John 12, Zechariah 9 and 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, this is such an interesting thing. They believed that Messiah would not just be a truth bearer and banner to God, conforming society and preserving Israel, but he would be a great military leader, and so he would come in on a steed. He would come, on, come in, on a, in, in an impressive manner, in a, in a, car- a presidential caravan, if you would. But Jesus is so unconventional uh, he, he selects a different mode of transportation. It's not a black, tinted, windowed suburban in a caravan. It's a Kia. <laughs> What's the deal with the donkey? It's incredibly symbolic for me and for you. This donkey was so pitiful, and it was had never been written on. It was untamed, unbroken, unyielded, like you. Uh, You're donkey-ish. You may have even called each other donkey-ish this week. I don't know. (laughs) But it's it's that kind of persona that Jesus loves. Uh, They measured horses in Jesus' day with the span of the hand. So they would start down at the hoof, and they would measure, and they would see how many hands it took to get to his head, and they would say, that's a whatever hand uh, horse. And it was the king or the commander or the emperor that would want the highest, tallest horse uh, it would need to be taller than his, you know, his officers. It would be, need to be taller than the army. And it definitely would need to be taller than the citizen. Hands all the way up. And this is, this is so Jesus. <laughs> this is just like something he would do. How are you going to ride into Jerusalem, them shouting, Hosanna? He said in Matthew 21 and 2, go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her, untie them and bring to me. Now, I've been reading the Bible a a good while, and this one just kind of got by me for some reason. I don't know why. I guess the other three, uh, Matthew, Mark, I mean Luke, Mark, Luke, John, tell it differently. But this is uh, interesting, untie them. And bring them to me. Two donkeys brought to Jesus. Is that possible? I don't know. It's what it says. Untie them, the donkey and the colt. So so he has like a couple of options. And he looks at his options and they're so pitiful. You got the mama donkey. And then if you do the hand thing, you know, you got the little foal. And so what is the king of kings and lord of lords going to come riding in on? He says, I'll take the foal. Now, this is, it would be comical, really. It's sort of humorous. I love Jesus' humor sometimes. He's just like, this is the one I want. It is possible that when he got on that foal, his feet (laughs) were dragging the ground. (laughs) Like, man. But he wanted to say something to those people, and he wants to say something to me and you. That it, who, he will, who he will choose and who gets selected to bring Jesus in to his assignment is so unimpressive. He, he will choose people that, that society says, what? That, that uh, people would like, 
Surely not. Do you know their reputation? He chose the unlikeliest, pitiful, little old pitiful foal. It says, come ride with me. Now, this foal had obviously never been ridden on, and Jesus sits on it, and it is transformed. It should be bucking. It should be rebelling. It should be unyielding, but it is calm. And so it is with what the Lord Jesus Christ does for you and for me and anyone who will say, I surrender. I surrender, Lord. I surrender to you. I surrender to you. I am the most unlikely person that you would choose, but I surrender to you. If you can use anything. Oh, there was a song back in the day when I was a younger man. And it was a song that said, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak to me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. How many would that be your prayer today? Lord, you can use me. I don't know what I'm good for, but if you can use anything, you can use me. Jesus is so unconventional. The people that strut and put on the, the, the dog, <laughs> thinking that God would be honored to have them, those are the ones Jesus says, yeah, you know, when I do the hands, you, you are tall. I'm not choosing you. Uh, you're, too, you're too involved with yourself. I, I'm going to take this one over here that doesn't think they're worthy. The one that won't even look up, beats their chest when they're praying to God and says, I am a sinner. That's the one I want. Bring that one to me. I can ride that one. About the time you think you're good enough for God to use you, let me remind you, you're not. We're all broken, complicated people, and it is only through the mercy of God that he chooses any of us. But I want to thank the Lord today on Palm Sunday that he used me. Uh, the Lord, he was so unusual about how he goes about stuff. When he was teaching, you know, uh, as a Messiah, he would do these amazing things. And it was called the Messianic Secret. And you can see this all throughout Scripture. We're like, there's two blind guys. I don't know why they were blind. I don't know if they're blind from birth or if they were blind from some traumatic thing, but they're blind. They can't see their kids. They can't see color. They can't see horizon, sunsets, blue bonnets. Can't see them. And their whole life would consist of begging because you couldn't, the, the society just had no, nothing to do. You just, you had to go beg. And so they would just be begging. And Jesus comes along. And, and in Matthew 9, uh, Jesus heals both of them of blindness. And then he says the most curious things. He says, Jesus sternly warned them, see that you, that no one knows about it. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think those two blind fellas kept that? No. I mean, bursting through their, the door of their home, embracing their beautiful wife that they hadn't seen the color of her eyes, her hair, the kids running through the town. Why did he do that? In Mark 1, 43, there is a, a, a leper. Now, leprosy was the cruelest, most evil disease of this time, and there was no cure for it. You just had to be isolated, and that was cruel because you begin to die painfully and slowly and alone. No one could come near you, so they had to stand outside the town. That was the rest of their life. One day they're in a, a job. One day they're in the community. One day they're in a family. One day in their house. The next day they get a spot. It's leprosy out. And they are ostracized and they're out. Jesus walks by a man with this cruel disease. 
and he heals him. And then he sternly charged him, see that you say nothing to anyone. You think he did that? Nope. I think he goes running and jumping and hugging and high-fiving and screaming, I'm healed. That's what I think he did. I'll ask him someday. And then uh, there is this 12-year-old girl. How many of you have daughters? How many of you have daughters? This 12, beautiful 12-year-old daughter. Uh, she's school, she's functioning, and then she dies. Uh, what, I don't know, we're not told how she died, just know she died. And they're grief-stricken. Uh, instead of planning for schools and middle school and high school, they're planning for a funeral. And uh, Jesus hears about it. He's beckoned. He comes. He heals that little girl. And then he tells the parents, Jesus strictly charged them that no one should know. <laughs> you think that happened? Nope. And so what is, this, what is this whole thing about? Is it possible that Jesus is more interested in the transformation of the heart than he is fixing your body. Is it possible he didn't want the notoriety to, to be on tricks and magic and miracles? He wanted the word of life to get in somebody's heart and transform them for the rest of their life. I love the Lord. Submission. Submitting is one of the greatest things you can ever say to the Lord. I'm a self-actualized man. I have an impressive resume, and I submit. You are the king. Hosanna, save now. Hosanna, submit now. Hosanna, third way it's defined, worship now. Worship now. Oh, worship now. The Lord wants you to be a worshiper. He loved that parade that was set up for him. Hosanna, Hosanna. He loved that. He loves when people worship him and praise him. It is so energizing to him. Now, before today, Palm Sunday, last night, Saturday, there was a, a, a banquet, a dinner thrown by a, a, a pretty affluent family. Uh, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and they loved Jesus for so many reasons. But one, Lazarus had died unexpectedly. He got sick. Jesus raises him from the dead. And so they have this dinner in Jesus' honor. They invite all the, the friends. I mean, it's a high-capacity crowd, and this is what happens. Six days before Passover, that would have been last night, Saturday, Jesus came to Bethany. Bethany is just a little uh, bedroom community right outside of Jerusalem where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then this thing happens that nobody saw coming and made everybody uncomfortable then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, that's perfume, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. That would have been so against uh, what a woman sh would be expected to do in those times. A woman never let her hair down. She takes her hair down. She wipes his feet with her hair. And watch this. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The smell of worship changes the atmosphere of the room. If you feel like darkness is, has come upon you, if you feel like depression is smothering you, if you're trying to get your head above water for what is facing you, begin to worship the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. And it changes the whole atmosphere. There's hope when you praise the Lord. There's deliverance when you praise the Lord. There's salvation when you praise the Lord. 
But not everybody was happy with how Mary demonstrated such extravagant love. There was this guy, one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. I object. What's your objection, sir? Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And then the Bible says, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Now, this part just shocks me, as keeper of the money bag. So he was the treasure for Jesus Incorporated. Jesus, Inc., he was the treasure. As the keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. <laughs> that thief. And this is what I'm like, who is the guy that gives a thief the money bag? Well, that would be the Lord. And why would he do something like that? Because he believes in you more than you believe in yourself. And I think that whole time he was trying to get through to Judas, I see you different. Uh, Judas wasn't having it. So the Lord rebuked him. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. People have speculated and said this perfume that got into his skin was so pungent. It was so powerful. It was so expensive that he would have carried that smell through Passion Week and all the way to the cross. Worship. Worship, your worship energizes God's plan. In other words, he's saying, I know what's ahead of me, the darkest times in my life, but your worship is going to help me make this trip. Your worship energizes God's plan. How many worshipers here today? The church I was raised up in was quite demonstrative. Uh, music would get going, and that place would start hopping. I'm, tech, I'm talking about it would scare most of you all the way to death. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, it, wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't uncommon. Somebody just jump up and start running. And I'm like, where are you going? Like, I don't know, but I feel so good I'm just running. People get off in the corner and just start hopping in place like this. And uh, how many of you know have been in anything like that? <laughs> I mean to tell you, we never knew what was going to happen. And uh, I would be so nervous because I would try to bring guests to church like they told me to. And they're like, Lord, help sister so-and-so not get happy today. <laughs> Please stay seated. Uh, there was this lady that started coming to church. And I was serving there on staff with my dad. And uh, we just started calling her Dancing Debbie. Because, I mean, the music would get going. And here she had come with a, a, a gold May outfit and a banner. <laughs> like she was trying to land a plane or something. Like, what, <laughs> what are you doing? And she would come running down the front. And I just like... I was so embarrassed. And I was just like, Lord, don't let any of my friends be here today. And I told my dad, I said, Dad, this, this, my dad was the lead pastor of the church, and I worked for him. I said, Dad, this is just not working for me. He said, well, what part? I said, this dancing Debbie. I mean, it's just, it's embarrassing. I mean, we're trying to present ourselves to the community. You know, we need to be a little more, uh, you know, buttoned down, a little more classy, and this lady comes running down here, trying to land a plane on an aircraft carrier, and what the deal? He said, well, do you, uh, do you know her story? I said, no. Uh, he said, well, she was married to a man. They had a son together, and that man, when she had that boy, abandoned her. 
She was abandoned. She had no family. She raised that boy by herself. When that boy was about 20, he made a terrible decision to drink and drive and got into a horrible wreck, and, and he died. So Debbie's alone, has been alone. And she was so despondent, and she was so broken. She, it was so dark in her soul that she thought, I can't take this pain anymore. I, I'll exit. And she said it was just about right in there that, she said, I'll, I'll give the Lord one more chance. And she went to church, and that day the, the pastor preached on how the Lord would turn your mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, your grief. He'll turn your mourning into dancing. And she said, Lord, for the rest of my life, I am going to worship you. And so when dad got through telling me that, he said, so what you think, big boy? You want to go tell her? I said, dance, Debbie, dance. You got it? You got to be careful how you criticize somebody else's worship. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know how God's healed them. You don't know how God's kept them. You don't know that in the darkest days of their life, it was God who reached down and snatched them up. So if you want to run, run. If you want to jump, jump. If you want to wave a flag, maybe. <laughs> However you worship the Lord is precious to the Lord. Precious to the Lord. Hey, thank you for being a part of service today. We hope that God's Word met you right where you are. We hope you took something that's going to help you move forward in God's best for your life. We want to hear from you. There's a link right below this video you can click on. Send us a note. Let us know what's going on in your world where you're watching from, maybe even how we can be praying for you. We love believing God with you for God's best in your life. You can do that by clicking that link, sending us a short note. Hey, maybe also you've made a decision to follow Jesus recently. That excites us. We celebrate with you. We want to hear from you. We want to know what God is doing in your life. You can text the word follow to 22999. We'll respond back with a link that you can click on. Go to our website. We have some great next steps for you, how to move forward in that decision that you're, you've made to follow Jesus. Whether it's water baptism, whether it's getting in a life group, or maybe even planning in God's house right here with us in Life Track. We know whatever that next step is, God has great plans for your life, and we want to be a part of seeing all of God's best fulfilled in your heart and in your life. We hope you're doing awesome. We can't wait to see you next time. If you don't have a home church, we would love to invite you to be part of Life Family. Remember, you belong here. Join us again next Sunday or any time throughout the week. Hit that bell so you never miss when we post a new video. Hope to see you again soon.